Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our eighth Let's Talk About webinar. I'm Shuan Smith, Diversity and Inclusion Manager at KTN and Women in Innovation Program Manager. And it's my honor to introduce our host for today's webinar, Sahar Hashimi. Described as powerful catalyst to drive entrepreneurship within big corporations, Sahar is founder of two disruptive businesses and has been set, seen up close how the unique spirit and energy that exists in a startup can dramatically transform behavior and performance. Her work has attracted international attention and made her a best-selling author. A former lawyer, Sahar started the UK's first chain of coffee bars with her brother, Bobby, building Coffee Republic to 110 stores and a 50 million market cap in five years. Later, she founded market segment defining sugar-free sweets brand Skinny Candy, selling it to confectionery conglomerate Liston PLC in 2007. Her book, Anyone Can Do It, has been translated into six languages and is the second highest selling book on entrepreneurship in the UK. Since moving on from her businesses, Sahar has worked to bring startup mindset to big companies facing relentless change and in need of more agility and innovation. Her most recent book, Startup Forever, is the culmination of her work speaking to 400 organizations about the actionable, practical steps that can bring out anyone's inner entrepreneur. It was named the Financial Times Best Business Book of the Month in March 2019. She's been repeatedly recognized for her work. In 2011, she was nominated by Director Magazine as one of its top 10 original thinkers, alongside Sir Tim Brennersley lee and Sir Jonathan Ive. In June 2012, Sahar was awarded an OBE for services to the UK economy and to charity. She has been named Pioneer to the Life of the Nation by Her Majesty the Queen and Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum. She recently co-chaired the UK government's scale up task force, shaping government policy towards growing SMEs. She currently sits on the board of the Scale Up Institute. She is patron of Child Bereavement Charity UK and on the advisory board of the ECB 100 Cricket Competition, BFC Fashion Trust and Change a social enterprise that trains and hires homeless people to run coffee bars. Sahar undoubtedly has extensive experience of starting and scaling businesses and we're lucky to have her as host for today's conversation. Alongside our panelists, Sahar will be discussing how to take it to the next level. So over to you, Sahar. Great. Thank you very much for that great introduction. Um, but I'm really thrilled to have a great chat with my three panelists. Um, so just before we start chatting, let me introduce them. So the first person is Chen Mao Davis, and I'm going to introduce Chen, who's actually a computer graphics and visualization specialist, which I can't believe. Chen, you've actually done the visual effects for Gravity and Blade Runner in 2049 um, with a world-class team, and they all won Oscars and BAFTAs for best visual effects. So um, that's pretty extraordinary. But um, on becoming a mother, however, Chen suffered from breast infections and postpartum depression after having insurmountable breastfeeding challenges. Um, in 2008, um, her experience and her technical expertise motivated her to establish LatchAid. And LatchAid is a femtech startup developing innovative technology to revolutionize breastfeeding and early parenthood support. Um, LatchAid's beta app has already attracted uh, users from 20 countries across six continents with app pilots with three NHS trusts in planning. LatchAid will be launched at the Apple Store in June. And um, Chen is actually the, um, a winner of the Women in Innovation Awards. The next one is um, our sole male panelist, uh, Mark Lynch. Uh, Mark is actually a knowledge transfer advisor at KTN. He's got um, extensive experience in managing R&D, manufacturing management leadership. Before the role, he was at the home office um, where he was head of mechanical engineering and he led a multidiscipline team develop, developing and delivering all sorts of specialist projects for law enforcement and government customers. He's also worked in a broad range of roles, um, but always delivering business benefits. Um, Mark's written a range of eBooks covering very useful subjects such as product development, CAD engineering, cost reduction, lean manufacturing topics, all absolutely tailored and perfect for um, small manufacturing businesses. 
And our third panelist is Kate Taylor. Kate is on a mission to educate, support, and inspire those with breast asymmetry through the community and products offered by her innovative business, Evenly. So Evenly is the name of her business. She's an IT specialist who's always been entrepreneurially minded. And I think like a lot of entrepreneurs has long dreamt of running her own business. So back in 2014, she wanted to disrupt the women's shoe market by selling mismatched size pairs to help the many people who've got one foot bigger than the other. But after speaking to a number of women, the feedback was um, shoes aren't my biggest problem, bras are. So Kate, who's based in Bournemouth and studied at the University of Surrey, set up evenly, the name says it all, to address the lack of non-surgical products, services, and education. She developed a line of silicon bra, bra balances designed to be worn um, inside the bra of a woman's smaller size to kind of match them up. And she as well, like Chen, um, has been announced a winner as the Women in Innovation Award. So we've got two Women in Innovation Award winners. So um, I'm absolutely thrilled, um, guys, to be having this chat. Now, the topic we've been given is um, kicking it to the next level and growing your business. And I think my perspective is, um, you know, I had a kind of extensive introduction there, but, um, you know, I started the company um, and, you know, I, I never really even thought I was remotely entrepreneurial, but, you know, wanting skinny lattes for myself in the UK, starting as a customer myself, um, I mean, it was seeing it and then seeing I couldn't get it back in London. So it was, you know, very simple. My story is, you know, I went to New York, I came across skinny lattes. I loved the whole coffee bar culture that they had in New York. That was new style coffee bars that I sold the sort of pre-Starbucks almost. I came back to the UK and I really missed it. And I couldn't believe we didn't have it. And I really missed it as a customer. So, you know, every day when I, you know, when I got back from New York, I couldn't believe I couldn't leave the house and go and start my morning in one of these buzzy coffee bars I said I, I sort of seen in New York. And I remember telling my brother, um, you know, gosh, I wish someone would bring those New York style coffee bars to the UK. And actually what I told him, it was my brother who got the light bulb and said, I can't believe you've said this. I think this is a great business idea. Why don't we do it? Why don't we bring American style coffee bars to the UK? And, you know, my, my initial reaction was, hang on a minute, you know, I'm a customer. Why, as a customer, should I provide a solution to my own problem? Because I thought, like, other people go to open coffee bars, and I'm just a customer, and that's the, that's the only thing I want to do, is I can't wait for someone to go and open it for, for me to go to it. But actually, um, you know, he encouraged me to actually, you know, being a customer is the best place to start a business. So really, you know, I started um, my first business as a customer because I wanted to drink lattes for myself. And we really grew the business from one and we started the first one um, in my mom's kitchen table. You know, we got a bank loan guaranteed through the small firm's loan guarantee scheme, you know, very much bootstrapping. And in five years, we grew to 110 stores. And we grew very fast because it was that sort of business. You know, you're not you're not going to travel to your nearest coffee bar. So we knew that scale was a big part of the sort of DNA of the company because you're really only going to go to a coffee bar if it's on your way. You might have a two minutes kind of diversion, but not really any more than two minutes. So we had to grow. You know, growing was was not was not something was not a luxury for us. It was just part of our brand. Um, but very much um, what I noticed about growing and my experience about growing was. Um, at that time, the idea was in, you know, start off being really entrepreneurial. And by entrepreneurial, I mean the sort of chaos and you do everything yourself and you bootstrap and you're always thinking about customers. And the thinking was when you grow, you've got to almost probably get different kinds of people and you've got to get systems and controls in. And, um, and what happened to us when we got to 110 stores slowly the sort of character of the company started changing. You know, we obviously moved out of the out of my mom's home and then we moved to an office. And at the beginning, it was really entrepreneurial. It was wonderful. There were no, no one had titles or anything like that. You know, everyone sort of started wherever, you know, they gravitated towards. And, you know, no one came with great CVs because we were pretty new and we couldn't attract great people. But as the whole coffee bar kind of trend um, took over, suddenly we were attracting great CVs from big companies. And it was really kind of as soon as we hired the big company types to really ramp up because we thought 
you know, we're not a startup anymore. We've got to become really professional. As soon as we did that, I could see the character changing. Almost I could see kind of barriers going up around people's desks. Um, you know, they were like, okay, so, you know, you've got to have a title. Everyone's got to have a title. You know, what's your title? Marketing director, you know, like what, what's everyone's role? And that was like a real shock to my system because it was just, you know, we'd gone from a really free flowing, really startup y environment where it was all about the customer to having a head office. And then I saw the transformation, you know, as soon as you have a head office, people are reporting to their boss. People are very centered inside the office. They've got no time to get out there where the customers are. And it was all about the weekly meeting. And um, do you know I mean? everyone was so busy in the head office that suddenly the head office became like everything about the business. And, and we lost that feeling. You know, we lost that sort of like that song. We sort of lost that loving feeling of being so customer focused and changing everything the whole time. Um, and it sort of continued this change of culture until we got to 110 stores. And, you know, me very much as an entrepreneur, I felt like um, I suppose my time is over. I suppose this is what they call, you know, kind of, gr you know, growing up. I suppose this is really natural. And, you know, entrepreneurs are great for a startup, but you don't need my passion and my enthusiasm and my customer connection when you're a big company because, you know, you've got systems and controls to replace that. And you've got to be professional. You've got to be grown up about it. Um, so both my brother and I, who started it, um, ended up leaving the company after five years. And in a way, giving it to what Silicon Valley calls the suits, the kind of, you know, people, adults, sort of what they call adult supervision. You know, when do you bring in adult supervision? And um, we, you know, we gave a little baby, you know, something we absolutely loved. And, um, you know, all I can tell you is, kind of um, after we left, very soon after we left, I mean, the company started declining. And it's sad that if you're a young person now, you don't even know what Coffee Republic was, whereas we were, you know, we were the first um, the first brand to bring that American style coffee bars. And we were pretty cool at that time. But, you know, it's a real, the demise of Coffee Republic has been a real example of um, how you can grow it the wrong way by not keeping the soul of the company alive. So, you know, I talk a lot about soul and I used to think soul was really like, airy fairy but um recently i saw on the cover of harvard business review there was actually a great article called the soul keeping the soul of a company and the soul is just that kind of little triangle between you know the intention of your business the customers and how you engage employees and keeping that really sacrosanct through growth is something that i talk about and i really really believe in um, so that's so that's a bit of a long-winded way of saying my own story. Um, but I just was going to get um, for our panelists. I just want to ask you guys about, you know, I so we read your bio, but I would love um, everyone out there to hear a, just a sort of um, five or ten minutes on how you started. Really, well, you know, what was the motivation and kind of where you're growing before we then get and talk about taking it to the next level. So, could I start with Kate, please, telling us a tiny bit of the story of the birth of your brand? Yeah, definitely. And and thank you, Saha. Um, that's really interesting. It's um, so where I'm at with Evenly, as you know, I started thinking originally about shoes, uh, realized that bras were a much bigger issue for women, um, identified them myself thinking, well, I've just been putting up, you know, with bras that don't fit um, perfectly my whole life. I just thought that was something unique to me. Um, suddenly I realized it's incredibly, incredibly common, um, whether it's through, you know, breastfeeding, puberty, menopause, lumpectomies, Poland syndrome, there's many causes of breast asymmetry. Um, and I started to think, why has this not been tackled by anyone? You know, why is there no good solutions? Um, I attended some lingerie fairs in Paris, um, came to realize that the lingerie industry um, is very heavily male dominated, which is was surprising to me. Um, I came from a male dominated industry. I've worked in IT my whole career. Um, I didn't expect lingerie to sort of have a, a you know, similar dominance. Um, and I just realized that maybe that's why bras are designed to be symmetrical, because maybe, you know, the prevalence of asymmetry is just, you know, obviously not front of mind, uh, you know, by, by male designers. Um, so I started to explore whether I could create a bra that would specifically support ladies with breast asymmetry. Um, I worked uh, and I continue to work with a really talented team of um, designers and lingerie technicians. 
Um, but we realized the, the R&D process for developing a bra that's really going to solve the problem is very, very technical. Um, it's taken, um, well, it's about three years to date um, to get where we have. Um, so in the meantime, I realized that no one's having conversations about breast asymmetry. There's no community. There's very little support and advice online. So I established the Evenly brand. Um, I set up a Facebook community for breast asymmetry support. And I developed a line of, of bra balances, as you mentioned, which are essentially um, very uh, sort of thin breast prosthesis. So where a full breast prosthesis wouldn't suit someone with asymmetry, um, these are more um, graded in terms of a cup size difference. So um, there's, there's sort of one to suit many different varieties of sizing. Um, but really the, the bra balances are a solution, but what I would really love is to have some bras that specifically support women. So through the Women in Innovation Award that I've been luckily um, awarded, that's what I'll be developing and taking to market. Um, but really the main goal with Evenly and, and my soul, as it were, as you refer to it, is um, embracing breast asymmetry, bringing up the topic, making ladies feel you know, that they're not alone. It is incredibly common. It's nothing to be embarrassed about, but, you know, you do deserve support. You do deserve comfort. Um, and, you know, symmetrical bras are not serving you. So to provide some other solutions that will do that. Amazing. And, how, and, and your customers. So how do you get your customers, Kate? And where are they online or through retailers or? So currently uh, we're purely e-commerce, so purely online. Obviously with my IT background, that was a, a comfortable place to start. But um, I am looking to partner with uh, bra fitters and retailers um, for the bra balances and ultimately our own line of bras. So I'm um, looking to diversify, I suppose, in terms of my growth journey, still very much at that sort of tipping point of, of now needing to embrace growth. So um, unfortunately, I haven't got much advice on looking back on growth, but I've got a lot of um, empathy for businesses that are at that pivotal point where they need to make some decisions about growth, because that's certainly where I am at the moment. And so you've already got your customer base, but you're now thinking of, of, the, of the next level. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Kate, that was, that was great. Chen, can we have a bit your story as well? This is fascinating and um, seems to be the same theme they've chosen businesses. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's really nice to kind of share with everyone about my breastfeeding and my kind of startup journey, really. So before I founded Lashade, I had a dream career working um, in the visual effects industry on um, feature movies. And um, and it was pretty much all my life. Um, I spent the past decade working on feature films from Warner Brothers, from Disney, from Marvel Studio. And um, I never really kind of prepared myself to be an entrepreneur. But in 2018, when I become, um, become a mother for the first time, I realized uh, how hard breastfeeding is. Um, it's not, not as easy as it seemed. It's really a kind of skill to be learned and mastered and improved all the time. So the kind of personal story for me was, um, I never really understand how to latch the baby properly on my breast. Latching refers to how the baby fasten on the mother's breast whilst feeding. And if you don't do it properly, and if the baby doesn't have a mouthful of breast tissue uh, in his mouth, then it will be quite easily to damage the mother's nipple. And yeah. once you have that kind of open wound, it's very easy to develop breast infections and all sorts of health problems. So personally, before I leave hospital, I already have cracked nipple. And when I got home, I started to develop um, kind of mastitis. And after I take antibiotics, I have thrush and then mastitis and thrush, three rounds of them nonstop. And it was very painful. And also it was, um, it was very demoralizing for me because before that I was uh, a career woman. I think I can do anything if I set my mind on, but I realized I can't even be a proper mom because I can't even feed my baby. My baby was so hungry. He cries all the time, but I was so anxious about every single feed because it was painful. Um, and so that kind of developed my anxieties and eventually led to postnatal depression. And the whole kind of experience is really dark for me. And but I persevered. I breastfed my child. I never stopped. And I eventually managed to, to, hold, uh, to basically feed my son until he was 
two and a half years old. The first six weeks was the hardest. But once I come out from that, I realized that anyone can do it. They just need more support. And then I look at the statistic, I realized that shockingly, the UK had the worst breastfeeding rate in the whole world. And 90% women like me give up breastfeeding before they want to because of pain, lack of support, health issues, and feeling of isolation, depression. And with my technology background, I think I can definitely do something about it. At least I can use CGI to help women how to latch the baby on their breast properly. Because usually we kind of, we, we are visual kind of animals. We learn things through looking, through that vicarious experience. We look at our mother cook rice, we know how to cook rice, but it's very hard to actually see how how to breastfeed these days. And YouTube videos are not having the same kind of quality, same good qualities, and it's very hard to actually visualize where the mother's nipple is uh, inside the baby's mouth and how to achieve that really good latch. So that kind of, um, from that, I started to develop a latch aid. So the first component uh, of latch aid was trying to use 3D avatars. Um, oh. I designed and developed with my colleagues in the visual effects industry, uh, trying to kind of show how a mother is feeding a six weeks old baby. And we have very complicated uh, skeleton, rigs, uh, muscles inside the mother and the baby. So the baby can really cycle the milk. We can simulate that kind of swallowing and suckling motion. And it's really lifelike. And you can really learn from just interacting with 3D avatars. and. As alongside this, I realized that women need peer support because if you are struggling in the middle of the night uh, for a night feed, or if you are struggling over the weekend, and if you just want to have someone to talk to and talk to you, you can probably carry on breastfeeding for longer. So yes, that about can probably carry on breastfeeding, breastfeeding for longer. Yes, which so is that virtual breastfeeding the support groups. And this really replicate real life peer to peer support groups which are sadly shut down during the lockdown, especially yeah. last yeah. this year. So it's like a what's happening environment, helping women to talk to each other, to give each other moral support. And, but the third thing I, I thought was missing during my experience was this 24 seven expertise because mm-hmm. midwives and house visitors only came to your house um, shortly after you have a baby and maybe be with you, you know, every other day and gradually, you know, visit you kind of after a week, after maybe two weeks, and it's not enough. What if you have questions? As a new mom, you have many questions about nappies, about baby's poo, about feeding, about everything. So based on this, we developed an artificial intelligence-based virtual supporter, and we simulate the brain of lactation consultants, and mother can ask any questions they like about uh, anything, you know, new baby related, and they can get an answer immediately. So all these things, um, I think uh, kind of form this really good product to help women through their breastfeeding and a new motherhood journey. And as you mentioned, uh, Saha, we have launched our beta um, product and we have now customers, well, not customers yet, beta users from 20 different countries. Um, and yeah. we are really launching our product um, at Apple App Store in June. We are oh. starting our pilots with now six NHS trusts and we really want to develop our B2B and B2C kind of um, business models this year. So winning Women Innovation uh, Award is life-changing for myself and for large Gosh, I can imagine. What a, how absolutely exciting. So you're only launching that in June and then presumably the NHS trusts give it to the new mothers and then they kind of activate it and must be so useful. Absolutely. Wow. Wonderful, Jen. Thank you. Thank you both for bringing it to life. I'm going to go to Mark now. Uh, Mark, you've heard the stories um, and you're a bit our kind of resident expert on the issues around growth. And um, what's interesting, I think both Kate and Chen is um, it's, you know, they're going to grow actually not not by, um, you know, increasing their product range in a way, but I suppose it's by growing their customer base because they've got quite a narrow focus on an area. What are your thoughts on that, Mark? Thanks very much indeed for inviting me. <clears throat> really fascinating stories and, and fabulous businesses. Um, for me, I think uh, there's a lot to be said for networking and identifying with people who've either done it before or the ecosystem which will support growth um, and scaling. So uh, fortunately in the UK, there is, there, is, there is a plethora of support organisations and mechanisms, but sometimes it can be confusing. 
Um, the ecosystem, if you like, to, to help small businesses scale can be confusing. Um, so there's a few I'd probably recommend. Uh, most people have heard of Innovate UK. Um, the KTN, Knowledge Transfer Network, is, is one of their partners. I would suggest getting in contact. Um, but I think there's others as well. So most organisations obviously are based somewhere. You've got local enterprise partnerships, LEPs, um, and their associated growth hubs. And these are excellent bodies in terms of providing the advice, the hands-on advice, um, in terms of things you might want to think about, uh, mechanisms you might want to put in place, others who've done it before you, um, others who may be, if you like, further along their growth journey. Um, so benchmarking, best practices, and then crucially, getting in contact with individuals who are, as you guys are today, only happy, too happy to talk about their individual journey. But the good thing about the organisations I've mentioned is that you can also then obtain the funding or access to funding, as well as advice. Um, for those who are a little further along the line, uh, you may want to start thinking about exports or overseas markets or different markets, or even just the market research to, to validate your idea. Um, but the crucial point I'm making, though, is there are organisations out there who will happily assist you um, on that journey. So don't do it alone. Um, you're already probably trying to juggle umpteen different things within the business as, as you're you know, the first couple of years, um, use the networks that exist really to help you scale uh, and help you move along on your journey. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. And so, Kate, in terms of um, uh, sort of growth, so do you have any employees at the moment? I mean, where, where do you work from? How do you work? Bring it to, to life for us. So um, I'm currently just a one man band, um, one woman band, I should say. Um, but I do have help from, um, as I say, product designers, um, lingerie technicians, um, some experts that I've been working with. Um, so they're not employed directly. And I, I would say that's, um, you know, a good piece of advice for other startups is, you know, don't jump straight to hiring lots of full time employees do you utilize freelancers, contractors, consultants, um, just until you're sure, you know, that there is a full time job worth of work there. Um, but I am very much at that sort of, as I mentioned, sort of tipping point where I do need to consider taking on more support, certainly around areas where um, I already feel as though I am competent at those things and therefore I should try and do it all myself. So, for example, the marketing, I've, I've got experience in digital marketing, so it's really tempting to try and do all of that myself. But I'm starting to realise that my own time um, is becoming a constraint and that could hold the business back. Um, so it's, it's becoming aware of where I think your time and your skills are potentially going to hold things back and, and being willing to let others in. I'm also um, soon to be a first time mother, so I'll be using a 10th product for sure. I'm very excited about that. Um, but, you know, that's brought a, a bit of urgency to the need to um, bring in more support. Um, if I want evenly to grow, I know I need to um, relinquish some of that control. But currently, that's um, that's where I'm up to. So uh, have you planned that, Kate, already? Have you have you got the system in place for the move to the next level? Uh, I do. Um, so some of the sort of steps are in motion. As I mentioned, I've got um, a good team of people that I'm working with, but I'm now identifying how I can take um, the product beyond the R&D stage that we're at with yeah. the bra into manufacturing readiness. Again, something that I don't have a lot of experience with through my own uh, IT career so I am starting to um, identify some professionals who can help me um, in readiness that, that, that I will need to lean on them a lot for support and to take the business forward. Um, I would say to echo what Mark said about the growth hubs I used my local growth hub in Dorset a lot at the early stages um, that's really really helpful and I think they they can point you in a lot of really good directions um, they certainly have for me um, and help you find if there's specialist support that they can't provide they can help you find others who can um, so that's really a good way to go. Really and can I just ask in the growth hub have you got one person that knows your business really well and directs you sort of signpost you to who you need or um no there's a there's a few uh, people there and they tend to specialize so there's a marketing specialist at my, at my growth hub a finance specialist so i've um along my journey i've i've spoken to most of them really and had their different perspectives so yeah they're all fairly familiar with it with the business um and offer their in particular their sort of insights but they've all run businesses themselves that's what i really like actually about the growth hub um everyone that works there is an experienced 
experienced entrepreneur and knows the you know the unique challenges that um, you're going to come up against, which is really helpful. Right, and Chen, what about you? Is it just just you with, with these? How many? Um, so we have a core team of six, including oh, wow. four, and we have a subcontracting team of thirty, uh, and this includes uh, six uh, subcontracting teams. And all of us work virtually, so our team is across four different continents. And I have a mad majority of my uh, team in person. <laughs> so we spend most of the, our time communicating on Zoom <laughs> and through WhatsApp and some other kind of virtual communication tools. Um, and our, our team is really kind of diverse team as well. Um, yes. so we have uh, three different software teams and one of them is in Brazil and they do artificial intelligence. And we have lactation consultancy team where we have uh, four or five different really, really experienced lactation Some of them were my ex-colleagues. They do modeling, animation, rigging of the virtual characters. Uh, and we have um, you know, people helping us to work the on the commercial side of things as well. Something I really, um, I really like is the kind of collaboration side of things. Yeah. Because you think about lactation consultants and kind of baby care experts, they talk about nappies, poo, feeding, you know, and AI experts talk about neural networks, talk about computer science, algorithms, data structures, but they can work together. And we work together all the time. When we develop this uh, neural network um, to kind of answer any questions a mom might ask, we basically meet up every day. Um, we, we analyze the AI's performance. If the mother asked a question about why my baby had a green poo, we realize if AI has answered, if we realize AI was not answering well by analysis sessions, then we try to retrain it to make it better. So basically at this moment, we have a thousand people who have already used our neural network. We gradually expand the user base to train this neural network to be stronger and stronger and more and more robust. At the end of it, I think my lactation consultants know more and more about AI and my AI team know more and more about babies. So it's kind of a learning process for all of us. The question is this idea of like the kind of startup mentality and, you know, a lot of people um, kind of, um, I've been reading and uh, listening to every single episode of Masters of Scale, which I recommend to everyone is a podcast by the founder of LinkedIn. And that talks about the kind of company culture and who drives it. And obviously from both of you and um, Chen, you know what you were saying, you, you're obviously the one with the vision, right? So how are you finding growth plus trusting the others? How much do you think with this team, you've got to push the vision or do you think by osmosis, they have almost taken on your enthusiasm because they've constantly in touch with you. Is that still easy for you to infuse them with, with the same thinking you've got? Um, I think something that greatly helped me um, is the kind of, I think the lactation consultancy team um, is critical. And um, because this, they are in this healthcare profession, they have this big heart and this love to mothers and babies and to help them. So this drives them to work hard. We, we're constantly trying to find what are their problems? What are their questions? How can we help them better? How can we answer this question better to help them? We WhatsApp each other if we see someone who has asked a question, even kind of early hours of the day, if we can help, we jump in to help because sometimes AI couldn't answer you know, some yeah. cases. Uh, how have you got them so passionate? So they're obviously as passionate as you. And I'm sure a lot of people listening are going to be like, that's great. So you've obviously found a really great team who really care. And I think that's, you know, not, not to be taken for granted because often yeah. you're getting someone, it's just a job, you know, it's, it's your business you've started. So how, how did you do that? I think I try to inspire people how technology can transform public health can really make a difference because a lot of people in my team were frustrated by the kind of patchy kind of inefficiency of the system. It's, it's not, nothing to blame, but it's a heavily face-to-face -face based industry. You go to see moms, you help them, but you know, what about if you can't go to see them? What about if in the lockdown? So I think inside they really want to see a change, but someone has to deliver this change. And happily, I'm that person who suffered from breastfeeding issues. Yes. I'm, and I'm the person who know how technology can make change. And I try to inspire them of what we yeah, can with actually your soul. do. Yeah, yeah, interestingly. And Mark, what's your perspective on that for the businesses you advise in terms of trusting others and how a founder who sets the culture can kind of pass the culture on to the, to, to the team? It's a really interesting point because it's something that 
if we could all bottle, we, we, we'd bottle and we'd distill it to everyone we recruited. Um, I think you're right. I think it's often it comes from personal experience. And it's interesting um, that my, both my panellists today have started their business based on personal experience. I think once you've got that and others experience it too, that passion, if you like, sort of almost shines out of you. So when you, when you get to the stage, you start scaling and you're recruiting other people. Ideally, you want someone with similar passion or someone who's got a similar, perhaps a similar experience or certainly the empathy. Um, but what I tend to find is that, you know, you probably come across this yourself. People invest in people, um, whether that's funding or indeed trusting someone to join your team or indeed once you've got a, a number of people in your team, motivating them in the same direction that you want to go in the business. So I think sometimes it comes from the, from the individual, the person. But I think there also is something in there as the business scales and grows and you take on the responsibilities such as um, performance management and incentivizing people, understanding, everybody understanding the importance of passion. Because, of course, they're going to be representing your business when you're not there, whether it's the suppliers or clients or whatever it is. So I think there's also something in there for most of us in terms of personal development and trying to build our charisma, build that passion and ensuring that really shines through whatever we do whether it's business or pleasure or anything else. Good. And Mark, that's actually the perfect answer because um, we just had a great question that I think both Kate and Chen will really relate to. Um, the question is, um, the Tanya Bacarda says, um, my business is also my passion, which I suspect blocks me from taking the right steps to scale it up. What steps would you advise I need to take first? So my answer to that, um, and I'm going to come to Kate next, but my answer to that is the fact that Tanya thinks that her passion blocks her from scaling up is, is, is actually, that's exactly where we all get it wrong, because we think passion is something about holding our business to ourselves. And, you know, I was given the impression that, you know, oh, well done, Sahar, it's great that you were passionate, that's why you started but now give it for us to run because passion is not something that big companies need. That was the sort of feeling was you need to have systems and structures in a business. But I think passion is what drives a business forward. Passion is what, you know, kind of passion, di disruption is a side effect of having passion. And if you haven't got passion for your customers, the passion that Chen is talking about here in terms of the problems she had herself, what Kate's talking about is really, because she's a woman herself, really being able to get into our customers' brains and think, actually, you know what? It's not enough for them to put the sort of silicon fillers. I'm going to come up with an even easier, better solution because there's a better way of doing this. That is the passion that's going to grow because it's that old thinking that you just grow because, you know, you're just in your own head and think, I want to take more of the market share. That's, I think, in a way, the old thinking and very much passion is the engine you need to grow your company. And Tanya, keep your passion and just go to your customers because growth is only going to come from your customers, really. So the more passion you have, the more you understand them, the more you understand what their problems are and solving their problems. That's the only way to grow your business. Um, Kate, I'm going to come to you to, uh, to answer Tanya's question as well. Yeah, so I definitely would echo exactly what you've just said. Um, the passion is so important. Um, I think you do need to hold on to that. I think where it does become tricky, and certainly I recognise this in, in myself and evenly, is sort of relinquishing um, some of the control. So I think you've got to be really clear on your passion and your mission. So, for example, with evenly, I'm obviously really passionate about body confidence, giving women confidence, not making them feel ashamed or that they have to conform to some sort of idealistic uh, view of what, a, of what a woman's body should look like. Um, I have already come across multiple people um, from, from a customer point of view or from a professional point of view where they've completely misunderstood that. They think it's about um, cleavage enhancement, looking sexy, anything like that. And, you know, they've got a completely the wrong angle um, entirely uh, they don't understand the the sort of wider support aspects that I'm trying to bring to life with the business um, and that makes me really nervous but what I've what I've tried to do the whole way along is make my mission and my vision very very clear so um, I've made it clear on my website any professional that I speak to I 
straight away try to get to the crux of whether they've really understood that and can empathize with a woman's position and they understand the the real mission of the company um and I think that's really important making sure things you know if you're going to outsource say your marketing making sure they understand the tone of voice you want to use the way you want to approach certain controversial topics etc so that you can feel confident to relinquish a bit of control um that you know that your passion um, and what you've built is in good hands and that people are going to uphold that. So it's it's not to say it's without its challenges, but I, I completely agree with what you said, Sahara, around, you know, the passion is what makes the business successful. You don't want to lose that. You want to harness that. Lovely. And uh, Chen, any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, the kind of soul for Lache is to help women, to help them, to to support them, to make them feel like they are great mothers. No matter what they do, they, they have all tried their hardest. So we try to be as supportive, as friendly as possible. We're not trying to be breastfeeding police and to kind of be judgmental. So we're trying to build this culture in our chat rooms, in the way that our AI chatbot talks to the mother. And we try to brief all our marketing kind of associates to be able to talk that tone that tone to make mother feel comfortable, feel confident. And we even built this uh, sentiment AI uh, with Innovate Your Case um, Women Innovation Funding, trying to make AI understand the mother's emotions. So when a mother say, I feel like I'm a big failure, I'm a really bad mom. So what's the emotions behind this? Our AI can discern that this mother feel desperate, this mother feel exhausted. And then we can give that empathetic answer rather than just an answer for something. We can we can support her and say, you have done a great job. You're doing well, hang in there, everything will be better. And that's another side of saying that the mother need, they don't just need knowledge, they need support and understanding. You see, and kind of, it's, it's amazing hearing you both. And I really think we're kind of, we're almost entering this new era whereby that idea of empathy, you know, this is a women and women, it's sort of innovating. So I think our audience is mostly women. And I think that's something that us women have to be much more confident about, that it's okay to talk about passion. It's okay to talk about the emotions of the woman and how they feel, because that's where innovation is going to come from. It's not about the numbers or the data or the kind of, you know, it's almost before they used to tell us, don't be so personal, you know, and just because you relate to it doesn't mean it's a problem everyone else has got but we're moving into this era where women are much more confident because we believe you know it's something we care about and normally if you really care about something it's most likely other people will care about it too so moving along to you know what people told me that oh Sahab, you know passion is flaky it's unbusinesslike that you have so much passion because you want to drink skinny lattes that's very much over and that's an area where us women have to own this area and the new empathetic business that we sought as a customer, I think is really the future. Now I'm gonna to go to another question and Mark, you're assigned to answer this question first. The question is from Christina Cran. Um, so Christina has a business, We Seeds, but she's also got another job. Um, so We Seeds, her business doesn't pay her. So she is asking us, um, Mark, how can I get past the lack of time and make the leap to my side hustle paying me a salary? So at what point does Christina move from the paid job to like her passion? Um, it's, it, it's, I can see the natural challenge. I mean, of course, the challenge is time, one of time. So um, for me, it would be a case of looking at the side hustle and seeing how she can potentially monetize elements of it. And some of this may be online while she's doing her day job. Um, once she starts getting some traction, I would then be looking to some of the organizations I mentioned before about how she can start scaling it uh, and, and, um, and growing, if you like, the side hustle such that it's starting to bring in some sort of income. Depending on her current employer, she might find the situation in the future where she can either work maybe four days a week or more flexible hours or essentially some way to give her more time to invest in the side hustle ultimately to grow it and to, to get the better returns from it. And ultimately, she knows how much money she requires to, to, um, to live by. And there'll be a point where hopefully the side hustle is bringing in sufficient monies. Perhaps the main job is she's scaled down the hours. And at that stage, perhaps it's time to, to make the move. But all the way through that whole process, I would be consulting with other people, um, communicating, networking, seeing other people's lived experiences, uh, making sure that she's certain within herself make sure she's got a good support structure around her and then eventually making the move. 
Yeah, brilliant. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. Now, um, I'm going to go to another consideration, which is, um, you know, with, in, with my hat as chair of the scale up um, review that the government did. Um, in this country, we're very good at starting businesses, but we're not that great at growing them. Mm -hmm. And scaling businesses, particularly an area where um, the female businesses, I think, are not that great at. Um, and I think a, a lot of the issues are, is in women have a lot of fear around growing their businesses. They've got other commitments, the sort of family commitment. So they think, actually, you know, I've started this business. It's sort of tipping along, but I'm not really going to take it to the next level. Um, so, Kate, my question is psychologically, like what, what went through your head? Because you're about to have a baby, right? So you're not thinking maybe actually, you know, I, I, I do quite well. I'm selling the kind of um, the, the fillers or whatever you call them. You know what I you know, do I really want to make that big move? You know, I've got the people working for me. You know, I've got an OK, comfortable status quo of a business that's kind of keeping me there. Why do I grow to the next level, especially when you've got a baby coming? Um, I think, well, <laughs> partly it's circumstantial in that um, the I, have, you know, I've had this business idea for about, as I say, three years now. I've been working on it. Um, it's only been in the sort of past twelve months that I've really launched my brand online and the bra balances. Um, but then I went on to win the Women in Innovation Award, uh, which happened just before my my pregnancy. So I already had grand ambitions. For the business um, and where I wanted to take it within the next year um, so really I've, I've kind of um, put myself in a position of necessity where I really have to now fulfill that um, and I'm really glad that I have because it would be really really tempting to like you say just say okay well I've got something that ticks along nicely I'm not going to push it any further um, but really I'm glad to have that impetus and, and that kind of reason to, to push it forward I would say um, you know funding and support is really important um, I think you know without the Women in Innovation Award um, and other grants that I've been able to secure um, I wouldn't be in that fortunate position as Mark said um, I was in a very similar position where I, I worked in IT I, I uh, moved into freelance and consulting to give myself time to then work on evenly but there does become a tipping point where you really just need the time to invest in your business and therefore you need to have an income. And I would say, you know, grants and, and any um, financial support like that can really um, just give you that nudge along and really hold you accountable to your goals and force you to, um, you know, think higher, think bigger, uh, make some grand plans, knowing you've got the financial support um, behind yourself. Yeah, brilliant. as they say, necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? For one of a better cliche, but as well, I mean, going back to Christina, it's, you know, at one point when you feel the business is viable, you've got to take that leap, haven't you? Because you will never know unless you take the leap. So Chen, with you, I mean, as well, you know, this, this was something you started, you could have kept a small, you've already got like six people, and yet you're massively ramping it up. So tell us about this idea of, um, you know, in a way, to, you know, taking on this quite big audacious goal of ramping this up and making it seriously big. But what's what was going through your head rather than having just an app that, you know, an easier life that manages everything? Okay, so um, firstly, I want to echo what Mark and uh, Kate has just mentioned. Um, I said have large shades um, when I was on maternity leave um, and I, I had my nine weeks old baby in the pram when I walked into a business incubator program <laughs> when I had no idea about what business is. <laughs> and then, you know, try to use my feet to vibrate the baby's bouncer and trying to do some work simultaneously. Um, and I think through this um, kind of experience, I learned that women have so much energy in them. You know, we, we are so much stronger than we think we are. We can juggle, we, we are really resilient and we have that emphasis that we can work with other people well. And I think all these things made me gradually learn to kind of start from a one woman's band and gradually have some volunteers and gradually win some grants and I can hire more and more subcontractors and eventually have my own employees. I think really, um, and, and really I only gave up my day job last December. <laughs> I gradually, oh, wow. so I was juggling having two children, managing, kind of international team and having a day job at the same time in the past couple of years, um, that has been hard. But I, the more I do it, the more it gives me confidence. I realize that, um, you know, 
no entrepreneur was uh, was born that has you said it, it's made you just have to go through all the difficulties all the rough patches and then you grow out of it and you become a better person and this kind of strengthens my vision and my mission because i really want latch to become a global business i want latch solutions to benefit mothers and babies around the world and i feel very passionate about you know, helping women from all social economic backgrounds to benefit from breastfeeding because sadly, there's a huge breastfeeding inequality and health inequality. Women coming from poorer uh, social economic background actually has much worse breastfeeding outcome. They don't usually breastfeed and they don't usually breastfeed for long, but their yeah. babies should really have the same best start of life as other people. And they really should benefit from this lifelong health kind of house uh, impact of breastfeeding and the mother you know mother both mother and baby so that drives me every day to think how can we scale how can we get more funding how can we expand our team how can we make ai smarter so it doesn't matter how many users around the world we have to serve we can grow <laughs> and we can cope with it so that kind of keep me up every morning keep me going every day I love it because I think um, I really believe like questions are the answers and you just asking these questions, how can we do that? And, and just kind of literally just asking the question and that kind of curiosity of there must be a way. I think the answer always comes to you. And, and I think some of us are so scared to even ask that question. But, but when you start asking it, is, well, that's when you're on a really journey of making it. Chen, that's wonderful. So Mark, what, what do you think are the barriers? I mean, we've had two examples of, of amazing women actually you know, on the road to growth. But what do you think from your experience um, stops Especially, you know, female businesses from scaling. You know, what are what are the sort of challenges that people think? Oh, I, I mean, I've got a great business, but I, but I'm not going to go to the next level. I think a lot of it's mindset. Um, some of it is confidence, I believe. Um, some of it is self doubt. So a lot of these are actually to do with the individual, and it's interesting because a lot of the stories we've we've heard today are around are around self belief, are about passion, are about perseverance having very supportive and good people around you who believe in you. Um, and if you like, all those things contribute towards changing the mindset. And I think once that happens, you, you can start breaking through some of those barriers. It's amazing how we can make time um, to, to pursue some of our dreams. It's amazing how we get the determination because of that passion to overcome some of the hurdles that are in front of us that perhaps we envisaged ourselves not overcoming a year or so ago. So for me, I think a lot of it is in the mind, but it's, out, it's around surrounding yourself with great people, great experiences, hearing other people's experiences, and sometimes feeding off other people's passions and some of those best practices. And once you start doing that, I think you can overcome lots of these, what I believe sometimes are mental hurdles. There are yeah. practical things as well, funding, et cetera. But that's, again, where the, the groups come in and networking, et cetera. Yeah, funny enough, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to the practical tools, but I think the mental stuff I always say about us women is that we've got every quality you need to be a good entrepreneur. You know, we've got the empathy with customers and um, we're multitaskers, which is what mm. you really need to be a good entrepreneur, right? Do a zillion things at the same time. Um, you know, we're really good at chatting, therefore the networking and getting information from everyone and passing how we feel, you know, how we feel about the business to, you know, we're, we're great. Every single thing is brilliant. But the only thing um, I think that sets us back as women is the mind and our overthinking so whenever I'm advising entrepreneurs, you know, I'm, you know, everyone, you know, women have got amazing ideas. And um, as Chen said, I've never met a woman who's not strong. I never met a woman who, who doesn't have this total skill set to be a fantastic entrepreneur, but it's just this overthinking. And so even I can imagine the overthinking comes in taking the leap to actually start a business because mm -hmm. it's just scary. And I think before you've taken the leap, it's really scary thinking about what it's going to entail. And you could have nightmares of, oh my God, like I can't do it. And can you imagine having lots of employees and the risks and stuff? And, you know, my, my only advice to that is just stop overthinking and start doing every day, exactly as, as we hear from Kate and Chen. It's just when you think about it, it seems really scary. But when you're doing something every day, 1%, that's all you have to think about and that's how you grow you don't grow by thinking big so I, I'm against the thinking big school because I think don't think big actually think small because by thinking small is how you eventually do get big and properly be able to scale your business and, and thinking big all it does is terrify you but um, putting the um, uh, the mindset aside Mark what do you think are the practical 
tools um, from women around, like, for example, funding and the techniques for growing? What do they have to have in place next? Um, for me, again, you, you, I'd go out there and look to see what's available. So for me, uh, I'm, I'm an advisor for a particular scheme um, called Knowledge Transfer Partnerships, KTP, and specifically management KTP. So just to give you a bit of an example, it's available to absolutely any organisation. It's primarily for organisations who are about to start scaling. But the idea is that the organization's probably got a, an issue or a problem or something it wants to achieve. What we do is we partner them with fantastic universities up and down the UK who've got expertise in that particular area. We bring the two together. Um, we scope a project. Uh, we hire, we get some funding. We hire what we call an associate, so you get additional resource. who will help drive that project with, um, for you within your business and ultimately embed the new capability within the, within the organization. So examples would be, in the sort of areas we've spoken about today, it might be executive leadership skills, it might be um, more productive processes, more efficient um, processes again as you start scaling and locking those efficient processes in. Um, it might be a different way of doing things and perhaps um, spreading a, a better mindset amongst your employees. But the point is there are tools like management KTP and others that exist. Again, go, you know, do talk to your growth hubs, do talk to your, to your LEPs, do talk to... Um, not Innovate UK Edge regionally to see what tools and techniques and schemes and programs are out there because they're out there, they're sitting there for you. And of course, there's an awful lot of research that's been, that's been done in this, this space. And it's really a case of asking, finding out what's available and then matching the best scheme for you and your business, depending on where you are in your, in your growth strategy. Brilliant. God, we could speak for hours, but we've just about got a few minutes left. Kate, what advice would you give to anyone listening about growing their business to the next level? One or two bits of advice, whatever you can think of. Um, I think I would just echo what you said, um, which is not to overthink it, not to get held back by the scary big picture, um, just taking it one step at a time, just thinking what, you know, what's next, what next step can I take to just take it that little bit further each day without overthinking the bigger picture. I think that's great advice. Lovely. And Chen? Um, I have a couple of advice. First one, really copying your idea again, Saha. It's about keeping the soul and passion of the business. It doesn't matter the size of it. Um, and the second, I want to share this uh, analogy of Chinese bamboo. Um, it is one of the fastest growing plants in the world. You know, it can grow shoot to the sky, basically, in the seventh year, but it takes seven years underground to grow that really complex uh, root system. And that really, shows us entrepreneurship is like growing a bamboo or like running a marathon. It takes years and years. Sometimes you put so much work on it and it never anything happened, but no, things happen underground. The energy and all that growth underneath, it will help it to grow to the sky the seventh year. So I want to encourage everyone to endure <laughs> with me to grow our business. Amazing, Chen. What an incredible analogy, the bamboo. I think it's so true. And just to say to everyone out there, you know, the, the Kate and Chen have won the Women in Innovation Awards. And they're just, for me, it's exactly everything I believe in, that innovation doesn't happen from, you know, thinking big and stuff in the laboratory. All innovation is, is problems. You know, innovation is such a fancy word for a problem. And all these two have done is they found a solution to a problem a problem they've had or a problem someone they know has had. And they have provided the solution to the problem. And there's absolutely no reason why every single person can't do that. And genuinely, there are women out there killing it in entrepreneurship. You know, do not doubt your, your, your abilities. You've got everything you need to be the best, to make all your business dreams come true. Um, so, so really go for it. And um, Kate and Chen, thank you so much for sharing your amazing experiences as an inspiration for everyone. Mark, you're a complete star full of information for us all, which we need um, to make this all happen. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting today's webinar, Sahar, and to our fantastic panellists, Kate, Chen and Mark, for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us all. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone that has joined us online today and uh, remind you that our next Let's Talk About webinar is taking place on the 12th of May, where we'll be finding great talent with uh, another group of fantastic hosts um, and panellists, and we hope that you can join us then. If you'd like to keep up to date with all the Women in Innovation news and events, please do sign up to our newsletter or visit our programme page or join our LinkedIn group. And once again, I'd like to express a massive thank you to Sahar 
for hosting the wonderful session today, our panelists, and to you all for joining us. I hope to see you again next time. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.